Well, so we're in a series called Winning the War Within as we were praying for just our church of really what's the focus and theme of the season. How many can recognize that the world outside these four walls is a bit crazy right now? That our culture has gone in chaos. And guess what? Here's the radical news. It's not going to change. It's probably not going to get much better. But the reality is we can be the light of God's kingdom in the midst of dark places that are undergoing traumatic changes. But the key part is we have to win the war inside so that chaos on the outside doesn't get on the inside. And it's only through God's spirit that we can find stability and strength in desperate times and desperate seasons. So as we were praying, God highlighted Galatians chapter 5. So do me a favor and and uh, open up in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, and then we'll jump to uh, verse 22 in just a second here. But we, we're focusing on this theme of the fruits of the Spirit and winning that battle that takes place inside of all of us. Verse 16 says this, Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. How many can recognize that our sin nature has some desires that want to get fulfilled just a little bit? I heard an amen right there. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. There's this war. There's this fight. We know the good that God wants to do in and through us, yet there is a carnal sin nature that we'd wrestle against. There are old desires that are part of our past life that start to creep into our present pa patterns and behaviors. But guess what? When God's spirit is working in us, he starts to produce fruit in our lives. Verse 22. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we've gone through a few of these fruits of the Spirit. We focused on love and joy and peace and patience, one of those fruits that all of us wish was not in that list, to be honest with you. But today we're going to focus on kindness. Now, often we just breeze through this list, and we're all accustomed to these various virtues or characteristics, but today focusing on kindness, you know, kindness really is something that is common or prevalent in our culture. We talk about kindness quite a bit. It's become this pseudo-cultural value where we all have expectations of kindness on people around us. Now, the basic meaning of the word kindness is this. It means a courteous or noble deed. That's the very fundamental meaning. It's this old word in Old English in around 1300 where it had to do with giving produce to your kinship, to your family in times of need. That's where the basic idea of kindness comes from in the modern English language. So they've been doing this study on kindness. They're learning that kindness actually helps people get happier. We actually do kind things. But they wanted to know when does kindness start. So Yale did this study called the morality of babies. I don't know why they decided to do this study, but their goal is to find when morality begins in the life of a baby. Here's a picture of one of the applicants for that study. So they have this study taking place. So they have these children in their room sitting with his parents, and they're all about one, two, three years old. And they have this puppet trying to climb up this mountain. And as it's struggling up this mountain, another puppet comes alongside of it and helps push it up over the obstacle of the mountain to achieve its goal. The scene then replays. They have the same puppet trying to achieve this obstacle of overcoming the mountain where another puppet comes in and pushes that puppet down the mountain. So they would replay this over and over again. Well, after this uh, test was done, they would bring the two puppets out the one that helped and the one that hindered, and they would place it before the kids. And 80% of the children picked the puppet that helped the other puppet up the mountain. I don't know what it says about the other 20% that did not pick that kind puppet. However, there is this idea that kindness is something that's attractive to us even when we're young. We're naturally wired to look out for those that are kind, look out for those that are safe. And in culture, we expect others to demonstrate kind behavior, and there's actually a trust that we have in other people. For instance, when I walked into the rock this morning, I did not expect the person in front of me to slam the door as I was about to enter. There was an expectation of kindness. When I am you know, in a parking lot and there's a car to back out, I'm expecting someone to not zoom past me and cut in that parking space that I've been waiting for. There's an expectation of kindness. But how many have ever noticed there tends to be a limitation to the kindness we're willing to extend to other people? There's a limitation. We don't want our kindness to be exploited. Whenever you open the door for someone, and then there's that person in the distance that is running to kind of go through the door that you've opened, and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't open the door for you. 
open the door for them, not you. And you're stuck in that quandary. How many have ever been in that moment before? Or you open the door and one or two people go and the next thing you know, three or four or five or six and you feel taken advantage of for this kind action that you have partaken with and now all these people are exploiting your kindness. So you walk into the coffee shop and there's that family that goes in and they have all their children. I'm off in that family. But they have all their kids running everywhere and you think, you know what? It's probably a busy day for them. I'm going to let them go ahead of you. And there's that one kid who's probably the most disobedient in the group picks the last pastry that you were going to buy. And next thing you know, they've exploited the kindness. We all go through this battle because guess what? It's not news to you. We are all selfish people. We are selfish, self-seeking people interested in what we desire to get accomplished. And Paul talks about this war. He explains it a little bit more in Romans chapter 7. I love the way the message puts this. It says this, yes, I am full of myself. How many can testify to that? After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act in another, doing things I absolutely despise. See, as believers, we know that there's this cultural kindness, there's this expectations, and we'll offer it as we see fit, but there's a kingdom kindness that God has called us to live. There's a kindness that's of greater measure and of greater value that pertains to sacrifice and service. But the reality is we do selfish things as believers and there's this war and I'll find myself engaging in behavior that's not the person I really am. A couple years ago when I was first married, my wife and I are late to the movie theater and you all notice this once you get married, you're about five minutes late to everything. If you're that punctual person, when you have children, you're about 30 minutes late to everything. It's just a given. So anyway, as a, as a punctual person, I was quite irritated. So as we arrived to the movie theater, we're late. There's two lines. It was before you could purchase tickets on your phone. There are two lines, and there's about 20 people in each line. So I'm, I'm late. We're missing the previews. It's the best part. We all know it's the best part because most movies are not very good. And as I'm waiting in line, I, I get anxious, and I notice that the third stand is about to open. So I get this idea. If I can run to the front of the line before she says next person, I can ask for my tickets and leave. I don't know what my inner logic was or why I thought this was a good idea. So the third teller opens. I sprint out of line to the front. I say, two tickets, please. And she said, uh, uh. Everybody starts to boo and jeer me from these other two lines. I mean, they're dropping expletives. I am, I'm like, she didn't say next person. She didn't say next person. And now I'm making this giant scene. The person says, I'm sorry, I can't. That man is so furious. I can't give you these tickets. So I walk back in shame to my wife. And she says, some Christian you are. I was like, what? She didn't say next person. She says, it doesn't matter what she did or didn't say. Get to the back of the line. So my wife kicks me out of line as she goes into the movie without me. There are these moments that we all have to face our selfish selves. And praise God for people that will call you out in those moments. We're called to live a different kind of kindness. The reason why that stuck out so well in my my life and my family is because we're called as believers to live a kindness that reveals God's kingdom, not our own kingdom. A kingdom that will cost us, a kingdom that pertains to sacrifice and service that's not conditional on what other people do or don't do for me. This is what Paul is talking about. It's a different culture, a different type of kindness. So here's our goal this morning. We're going to do a brief study on the word kindness, going back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at the kind of the etymology of it and how it started and how it kind of developed and grew in the life of a believer and really what Jesus has called us to live today. At the very end, my good friend Bud Brown is going to share his story. He shared such an impactful story of how simple acts can make huge impacts in people's lives. So do me a favor, turn to Genesis chapter 20. We'll start there. This will be a little different than normal. We're normally, we kind of anchor in one story. This will be a little bit more of a study. So if I go too fast, you can grab a shot of the screen and any verses you want to look at on your own time. 
So Genesis chapter 20, verse 13. I'll give you a little bit of background to this. We now have the story of Abraham. His name was Abram. Aaron alluded to it earlier, where he's called in this journey of faith and wondering. He leaves his own town. He leaves his tribe. He's now a solo act with his wife, Sarai at the time, and later known as Sarah, and a few other family members. And they're just following this journey of faith. Well, God reveals himself in the stars and gives them these great promises. He asks Abraham to sacrifice in front of him, and the fire of God comes and envelops the sacrifice. He is then spoken to audibly by God and given a part of God's name. We have this amazing journey and this amazing story. Well, after all of those acts of faith and miracles take place, in Genesis 20, he's traveling, and he's about to go into a town of this one king named Abimelech. And he tells Sarah, his wife, do me a favor. Don't tell them you're my wife. Tell them you're my sister so they don't kill me. Probably an interesting discussion to have with your spouse. So as he has this, we then have Abimelech the king take Sarah, his wife. Abraham doesn't say anything. He, she ta- he gets taken into Abimelech's house. Abimelech has a dream by God. Now, this is not a man that would be known as a believer at that time. And God says, you've taken another man's wife. And he says, what are you talking about? This is this man's sister. He says, no, she's marked by me. If you don't return her, I will kill you. It's a pretty straightforward conversation by God. He wakes up, calls Abraham in, and this is what Abraham tells Abimelech, verse 13. And when God caused me to wonder from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. What a distorted view of kindness. He says, if you want to do me a favor, wife Sarah, do me this kindness and tell everybody we're not married. And what we learn is that the early understanding of kindness in Hebrew is really not our understanding of kindness today. The basic crude understanding of kindness was loyalty to a family member or friend. So you would leverage this loyalty or kindness based off what that individual owed you or what you had done for them. So he says, do me this kindness. And that was the basic understanding. We then see it develop a little bit further in Genesis chapter 40. I'll just give the brief story of this. We have Joseph. He's locked in prison. And as he's in prison for really no reason at all, he's been falsely accused. There is this baker and this cupbearer. And they each have these dreams, and they're going to be put to death because they're accused of poisoning the king. Well, Joseph interprets the dream and saves the life of this cupbearer. And this is what he tells him. Verse 14 of chapter 40. Remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. Kindness is viewed as this exchange of favor. So if I've given you a favor or done something for you, you owe me the kindness out of loyalty to exchange it back to me. But how many know kindness is fickle and kindness can be forgotten? Verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgotten. He was forgotten by him. Here's this idea of kindness as this exchange. It was later on used in the midst of the context of war and tribes or nations doing favors for one another. Here we go. Again, it's leveraged. 1 Samuel 15. Saul is uh, speaking to the Kenites. He says, Go, leave, withdraw from the Amalekites, or I will destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites withdrew from the Amalekites. Again, kindness, not per the definition that many of us would know. He leverages loyalty and says, you better move. I'm remembering what you did a few hundred years ago, but if you don't move, I'm going to kill everybody in your land. Not the kindness we're accustomed to. And this type of kindness let the people of Israel wanting. They knew that kindness had to be more than just an exchange of loyalty or an exchange of a favor. And they started to talk about this idea of the righteous person or the righteous individual. And you'll read in the wisdom writings, this is when we next find the word kindness used more prevalently, is that Solomon starts to write about kindness, and the mule starts to write about kindness. And we find it in Proverbs 21. It says this, Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life and favor. 
So we start to understand that a righteous life lives this kind life that's different than just the loyalty that the culture knew before. Here's what one scholar writes about this word. Kindness tra- translates from the Hebrew word has said that is very common in the Bible, but its meaning can hardly be conveyed by a single English word. It has to do with love, loyalty, and faithfulness. So now there's this idea starting to develop that kindness has to do a lot more with the character and likeness of God's heart. And then we hear David start to write psalms about the kindness, about the goodness of God. Psalm 31, verse 9. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, same word as kindness there, that you've laid up for those who fear you and accomplished for those who take refuge in you in the sight of everyone. They start to talk about kindness being this resource of God that is endless and that even when we don't deserve it, God extends his kindness towards us. How many are grateful for God's kindness? See, God extends his kindness towards us even when we don't deserve it. They start to get this idea that kindness has a lot more to do than just loyalty or exchange. It has to do with mercy. And one of the main pictures of the kindness of God is found in the book of Hosea. And Hosea is an obscure prophet. Many of you may have not read it before, but it's really a a dynamic story and difficult to understand in our culture. Hosea marries this woman named Gomer. And Gomer rebels against their marriage, commits prostitution. He forgives her. She cheats yet again, forgives her. And then finally she sells herself into sex slavery. And as she's sold, it says he musters up the resources he can and purchases her back on behalf of God's love for her. And God speaks to the nation of Israel through this story and says, as Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea, so you've been unfaithful to me. But remember this act. Remember this example because that's my loving kindness towards you. Hosea chapter 11, verse 4. I led them with cords of human kindness or loving kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. See, God cares for us even when we don't deserve it. You see, cultural kindness is often conditioned on what someone else does for you and has limitations and expectations, but God's kindness is extravagant and reckless. God's kindness extends past what we deserve, beyond what anything we can comprehend or imagine, and this was the idea as they started to look up to God, they recognized we are so unfaithful to you, yet you're still faithful and kind towards us. This is the mystery of the God we serve. And from that premise, Paul wrote Romans 2. He links it right in these verses from Psalm 31 and Hosea chapter 11. As there's this self-righteous group of believers in Rome that start to say, you're not being devout Jews or you're not following the laws of God properly, they start to point the finger at those that are not living the righteous lives that they would deem. And as Paul creates this fictitious argument, he says to them, is it not the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? Is it not God's kindness that we don't deserve that actually leads us to change and be transformed? This is what we have to understand. When we're believing for God to change the heart of other people around us, our judgment isn't going to change them. God's kindness and love will change them. When we start to extend and show grace and mercy that is not deserved is when the conversation starts to change. And that's the love and grace our culture needs. Now, I will change this a little bit. We often communicate love in our culture as tolerance. That's not the love that God talks about. There is gracious love, but we tell truth in love. And this is what we have to understand. It's this piston. It's this engine of truth in love with the kindness of God and undeserved mercy and undeserved grace. That's the beauty of the gospel. It doesn't mean we bend on our convictions and our values, but it does mean we show love to those that don't deserve it, as we were those people. And that's the journey we're on. That's what kindness looks like. And Paul continues to admonish those as he's teaching them in churches and says, listen, the kindness of God you studied about in the Old Testament, it was made perfect and visible in the life of Jesus. Titus chapter 3. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. See, kindness intersects with mercy in a way many of us don't understand. And God often calls us to be kind to individuals that don't deserve it, that haven't earned it, because that's the beauty of God. 
And as they modeled this sacrifice, we have to remember, when the early church thought of the kindness of God, it was made manifest or visible in the life of Jesus. The, everything they would think of was how much Jesus sacrificed for us. So it's the very first thing we recognize, the quality of the church. Acts chapter 2 says they sacrificed for one another. They served one another. If there was ever a need amongst the community, they would give to that need. And what we learn is in the New Testament, whenever you see the word kindness, it's synonymous with the generosity and goodness of God. That kindness, goodness, and generosity are entangled in this beautiful mess called the Christian's life. And we're called to live this kindness. And what I love that Paul says beautifully, he says, listen, you have to clothe yourself with kindness. How many know we can forget to live a kind life? We can forget to do those simple things that actually make a difference. And when Paul would speak about this in Colossians 3, see, every tribe had certain clothing that they would wear that would identify them with their tribe. And Paul says, listen, you got to remember to get dressed. And one of the things the church is supposed to be identified by is their kindness. The culture should recognize us that that's a believer because of the kind life, the generous life, the sacrificial service-based life they live. Because here's the reality. The kindness of the culture is convenient. But kingdom kindness will cost you. It will cost you. It will cost you your resources. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your life. And it's often those simple things we do that make massive impacts. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was incredibly convicted by something that happened in my front yard. How many know you can't get away from the sign of the Lord when it's actually literally in your front yard? About two years ago, my wife and I moved into the neighborhood just down the street. And right across the street, as we were praying, we recognized that there was lots of people in and out of this house across the street from us. And then we started to notice bags being dropped off at the door and picked up by other people. So we were a little suspicious that there were some things going on that maybe were not legal at that house. Well, as we were praying, we recognized this is a, this is a drug house. So there's lots of drug drops taking place. And so, of course, mission number one is to get these guys saved. So we are praying, building relationship, and working on our, our time with them. Well, after time, things just continue to escalate, get worse. Cops are being called over regularly. So we're praying. Okay, God, first prayer is save them. If not, send them somewhere else because they can't be in our neighborhood. They're affecting the lives and, and quality of life around the people around us. So as we're praying, out of nowhere, my wife calls and says, hey, there are police cars and, and helicopters all over the neighborhood right now. They've busted the house. We're like, thank you, Jesus. Answered prayer. So we're there, and the house gets disbanded. And next thing we know, that it's shut down by the city, and the landlords have to go this massive construction project in this house. So as they're there renovating everything from all the damage that was done, they finally put it back up for rent. And then one of the pre people in our college group comes over and says, is the house for rent across the street? And we're like, yeah, but, you know, rents in Roseville are really high, and, uh, you know, it's, it's an expensive house. We've talked to some friends, and we're hoping people can move in. She says, I think God might be asking us to move in. I said, you know, that's really sweet, but it's a very expensive house, and I, I know you work part-time, and maybe you can get some friends, but you guys don't want to live in the burden of a, a rent payment that high. She's like, you know, I'm going to talk to some of my friends. Four girls get together, approach the landlord, and say, this is what we can afford. The landlord that's just renovated this house says, okay, I'll rent it to you. You seem like nice girls. And here are these girls living across the street. So now on Friday night, we normally would have drug deals and chaos going on. There are literally all-night prayer meetings taking place. And I'm, I'm literally, they sing so loud, they wake up the neighbors. I tell the neighbors, hey, it's better than what was there before. Just take it. <laughs> so... As time goes on, and this is where the kindness intersects, Naomi is visiting our neighbor, Vera. Here's a picture of Naomi and Vera. Vera is in her mid-90s, and she's the oldest resident in the community. And She was there when every house was built and grew up in this house. Well, as Vera's there, her family's over, and ambulances have been being called quite regularly because it's just Vera's hip and back and not able to move around the house. Well, the family wasn't able to afford live-in care. So they were having the conversation, the reality that Vera's going to have to move out to an elder care facility. Well, Naomi gets wind of this, and Vera is really distraught by the reality of leaving this home because she thinks it's the end of her life. So Naomi goes over and prays and tells us, God told me to move in with Vera. I 
I said, really? She said, yep, I was praying, and God said to quit my job and to move in and just receive whatever they could pay me. And of course, I, I, I love Naomi. I think, this is not wise. <laughs> That's just the first response. Naomi, this is great, but this is, you know, this is a big deal. And she says, I know, I know. God's calling me to it. I said, okay. She moves in. Well, now, Naomi, this radical worshiper, starts worshiping in Vera's house. And we had prayed with Vera before, but whenever the topic of Jesus comes up, it gets quickly avoided. Now, she can't avoid Jesus living in her house. <laughs> so she's worshiping, and she's inviting Vera to have Bible studies, and Vera doesn't want to have Bible studies, but then Naomi says, I'm going to have a Bible study, and the TV is going to be off, so you can join me or not watch anything. And and they're having these conversations. Well, finally, Naomi just has a come to Jesus moment, literally, and says, Vera, the end is coming soon. God loves you, and he wants to be the center of your life. Have you ever received Jesus in your life before? I think when I was a kid, I said something. Well, it's about relationship with him now. And Vera gives her life to the Lord in her 90s. It's incredible. So as they're there, Naomi says, let's celebrate, and sets up a meeting. She says, what's your favorite restaurant? She says, I haven't been to a restaurant in years. She says, well, what's the last restaurant you remember something good at? She says, Olive Garden. Those breadsticks are awesome. <laughs> so Naomi calls the neighbors next door, and they take Vera out to Olive Garden to celebrate her life. Aww. Vera communicated it was one of the greatest nights of her life. Because it was the first time she can remember going out to dinner, not for someone else, but just because it was her. This is the kindness that God's called us to live. A kindness that will cost us. And sometimes it's the simple act of doubling your tip when you're out to eat. Sometimes it's the wild act of quitting your job and moving in with someone else. But the bottom line is this. Kindness is something we have to be conscious of. It's not accidental. It's not occasional. It's something, as Paul said, we're called to clothe ourselves with, to live within. And this is a kindness that will cost us. And we see this modeled in the life of Jesus, that he sacrificed, that he served. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And this is the kindness our culture here at The Rock is called to live out. So we give lots of opportunities for outreach and local mission and global mission. Uh, but really, one of the uh, instrumental parts of that has been a man named Bud Brown and his wife, Carol have done an incredible job, but he shared a story a couple weeks ago uh, of just what simple acts can do in the long run. So would you welcome Bud as he shares. Give it up for Bud Browning. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> well, I did this at 9 o'clock, and everybody gave me their input, so I'm supposed to hold the mic closer, slow down, <clears throat> take my time. Of course, Brandon telling me that there's not much time between 9 and 11, so get in, get her, uh, get her done, and get out. <coughs> kind of having flashbacks of Vietnam, but uh, <laughs> just kidding. There's not as much time in between the 9 o'clock. I get it. <coughs> so anyway, Brandon uh, asked me to share a story that I told him and Rachel a while back uh, about an act of kindness that we did uh, uh, 42 years ago that Carol and I, my wife, did. And so the... The, uh, the crux of the story is uh, how long does it take uh, a seed plant to grow? And, you know, sometimes don't get discouraged. It could take a long time. It's, it's in God's time, not our time. I forgot to mention that last time. But So anyway, in the mid-'70s, my wife Carol and I moved to San Luis Obispo as I was going to be attending Cal Poly, majoring in architectural design. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are also going crazy. My third year design project was to design a restaurant, which we ended up actually building, owning, and operating. We called it Chocolate Soup. Needless to say, our lives are pretty hectic, going to school, running a restaurant, but sometimes more than we can handle. No time to start a family, but we, did decide, but we decided it might be fun to volunteer at a local Big Brother, Big Sister organization to work with kids whose families were struggling, and so we did. I also kind of looked at it as kind of a test kit opportunity to see if we would <clears throat> actually be like to have a kid, but if we didn't like him, we'd you know, kind of give him back type thing. So <clears throat> I wasn't a real strong Christian back then, probably, but... Anyway, after going through a screening process, we were paired up with a nine-year-old Hispanic girl named Sherry. When we first uh, met Sherry, she was living in a rather seedy Pismo Beach motel room with her mom and several <clears throat> brothers and sisters. She was very quiet and shy, obviously didn't know us, but welcomed any 
opportunity to get out of that motel room. So we would take her on an outing to the beach, zoos, the fair, uh, out of town trips. She would even spend the night at our house where Carol would make pancakes the bre for breakfast the next day. We probably spent two years with Sherry, most every weekend, just having fun, exposing her to things that we enjoyed, loving on her, just giving her the gift of time, showing her some acts of kindness. Eventually, though, we left, and Leah and kind of lost contact with her. <clears throat> Here's where God's time comes in. About 27 years later, I get an email saying, is this the bud that went to Cal Poly owned a restaurant called Chocolate Soup back in the 70s? Apparently, Sherry looked up my name, and, I, and our business website came up in the bio about me and how, how I attended Cal Poly and owned a restaurant. <clears throat> My response was, yes, who is this? She replied, it's Sherry, the girl you and Carol spent some time with uh, from the Big Brother, Big Sister organization back in the 70s. <clears throat> uh, a series of emails did ensue, and I did uh, get Sherry's permission to just read them off back and forth. So uh, basically, I said, wow, how are you doing? She then said, I just wanted you to know how much <clears throat> the time we spent together meant to me. I know you guys moved away, probably thinking nothing good was going to come in my life, seeing the circumstances that I lived in. But I just want you to know that my life did change for the better. I married a youth pastor. I have three kids, and we live in Oregon. She went on to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I often think of the nice times we spent together and the love and attention you had for me. I didn't get that from my own family. You guys literally changed my life, showed me there was a, something better than what I was living. You were, truly, you were truly one of God's greatest blessings in my life. To this day, every time I make pancakes for my family, I think of Carol making them for me. Living in a motel room, my mom never cooked anything, probably insignificant to you guys, but, one of the th uh, but, but it's one of the things that has stuck with me my entire life. <clears throat> I often share this story of our relationship and the pancakes with my children but every couple of years, and then talk about how simple acts of kindness can have a significant impact on others' lives. You definitely planted a seed in me as a kid and showed me a sense of normalcy. <clears throat> I wish you could have been there. When I was growing up as a teenager, it would uh, have made a world of difference. I never knew a lot of things were possible. Going to college, dreaming big. My mom always talked about my big, mean, my big dream should be to marry someone with money and many other ridiculous comments like that. Instead, of, as I said, I'm happy married. I'm blessed with kids, grandkids. I even volunteer at a local youth program. Seems like a good fit for me. I'm looking forward to the day when I can introduce my family to your family. <clears throat> I responded, I too wish we could have been there in your life uh, as a teenager. As far as your mom's advice to marry someone with money, that's the world's view of the measure of success. God's view of success is that the greatest thing you can become is a servant. Christ himself came to serve, not to be served. As long as you're loving the Lord with all your heart, loving your neighbor, you have achieved God's goal of who he wants you to become. Sounds like you've been doing that. Be proud of what you become, not remorseful. I know a lot of educated, successful people that haven't got it yet, still striving to, be, still striving to become someone other than God, but desiring them to be. <clears throat> Your mom did the best that she could with what she had. Not easy being alone, struggling and raising kids by herself. To me, that's probably one of life's greatest challenges. We haven't heard back from Sherry since. We were hoping our families can get together in their future. If they come to visit, we'll bring them to the rock and introduce Sherry and her family to you. You know, Sherry's story kind of reminds me of the footprints in the sand poem. When she felt alone, seeing only one set of footprints, that's when God was carrying her through to a better life. By the way, <clears throat> the, by the, way the first lines of the Big Brother, Big Sister mission statement is that our mission is to, buy, is to provide children facing adversity with strong, enduring, one-to-one -one relationships that change their lives for the better forever. I should probably drop them a line and tell them mission accomplished, in her case. Uh, people have told me you don't actually have to do anything to be saved other than to believe, confess, and acknowledge. I agree. The scene of the crucifixion with the thief is proof, proof of that. To me, that, that represents such a beautiful moment, hope for all of us, even up until our last, brine, last dying breath. By grace, you are saved a simple <clears throat> probably, uh, yet probably the most poignant verse in the Bible that fits on a bumper sticker. But what about the rest of the Bible? There are countless stories in the Bible about how Christ desires us to live our lives, how to draw closer to him, how to become more like him. <clears throat> we have an, ac an acronym for this. What would WWJD, what would Jesus do? I've also seen it, what D WDJD, what did Jesus do? <clears throat> I like that one better, kind of like Bob's living the mission uh, series that he had, that uh, just read the Bible and just do what Jesus did. 
I always look for signs in Scripture in the Bible that would show me <clears throat> what God's will is for me, how I should live my life, how I should spend my time. Francis Chan has a quote, Our greatest fear should uh, not be of failure, but of succeeding at things that, that doesn't really matter, that don't really matter. Kyle Adelman wrote a book, hence the uh, shirt, uh, called Not a Fan. He talks about don't sit on the sidelines and just watch. Be a fanatic about following God. <clears throat> be a player. It's much easier being a fan than a fanatic. A fan just has to sit there or sit back, applaud, encourage, applaud, encourage, support. Being a fanatic, a player, you actually have to do something. Sometimes it means getting dirty, sweaty, <clears throat> sacrificing time, etc. Although there are many how-to passages in the Bible about how I should spend my time and actually be a player, the first one that popped into my mind was Matthew 25, 34 to 40. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will ask him, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry, feed you thirsty, or give you something to drink? When did you see a stranger and invite, see you as a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? <clears throat> when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, whenever, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 